Golden State Media Concepts Technology Podcast covers everything tech. The hottest mobile phones, tablets, games. We review it, rate it, test it. Whether you're Microsoft or Apple, Android or iPhone, we'll give it to you again and again. Black and white. The Golden State Media Concepts Technology Podcast. Welcome to Golden State Media Concepts Technology Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Charney. And I'm Shane Northrup. Today we talk about Apple and cybernetics. And let's just jump into it. Apple's new updates to their laptop line now includes dongles. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Instead of having everything plugged into your laptop, or at least into your laptop, now you're going to have a little growth on it. Oh, tell me about these dongles. I'm so I'm, I'm, I'm interested. What what is a dongle, Jonathan? <laughs> it's pretty much something you plug into something is the best way to describe it. So because Apple doesn't like ports, holes, or any other convenient thing in the laptop, now for example, you're going to have this thing. The best way I could describe it is it's a box with with either a, a lightning bolt or USB three. Plug it into the side of the laptop, and it gives you the ports that the laptop doesn't have on it. But doesn't that make things less portable? It does. Doesn't that make things more difficult for the average consumer? And more expensive. That's the question I have. I mean, it's not like Apple laptops are cheap to begin with, but imagine if you lose that $100 dongle and you somehow have to find it in your local Walmart, which, by the way, doesn't carry anything on Apple that's not a phone. So let me get this straight. I can pay $700 and build myself a good computer, or I can buy an Apple computer for $2,000 and then have to buy all the accessories to go with it. That's a bingo. (laughs) It's just, it's ridiculous. I mean, I'm not quite sure why they want to do this. It's just like how allegedly on the new phone, which they're going to announce soon, is not going to have a headphone port. It's like, hello, wake up here. Everybody's been using it since, I don't know, the beginning of time, practically, at least since everybody who's listening to this podcast. Why change it? If it ain't broke, don't fix. What's wrong with having... I don't know, multiple USB ports and, I don't know, maybe an HDMI slot. Every laptop under the sun has it except for, hey, Apple. Hey, well, you want to know what this really reminds me of, Jonathan? This reminds me of the Sega Genesis. (laughs) Okay, I'm listening. So if you're not familiar with the Sega Genesis, they had all these cute little add-ons. Like, so when the 64-bit... Oh, what was it? The the 64-bit race was going on or the 32-bit race was going... Well, I think it was the 32-bit race. They made a cartridge that you put inside your Sega Genesis, and then you put your games inside that cartridge to make them 32-bit. Yep. And so, like, it was this beastly thing that fit in it. And then there was the... What was it? Was it the Sega Jaguar, which was, like, the CD? Yeah, they had the Sega could, CD, yeah. So, like, you... Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, no, no. It was uh, Sega Genesis, and they had the, the Sega CD, where you, like, stick your Sega Genesis into this CD player <sighs> thing that kind of fit in the side, and then, like, you had a CD player, then you had your Sega Genesis, and then you had your Sega Genesis 32-bit card. That you fit in there. It just and, made it bulbous. Yeah, oh, man. Like, if you put all the attachments for the Sega Genesis on the Sega Genesis, it becomes a beast. And that's what I'm imagining these lap, so, these new Apple computers being. And, you know, like, I, I mean, are, are they going to end up like Sega? Is Nintendo going to – is um, Microsoft going to win like Nintendo did? I see – I don't think so. Apple, the one thing nobody realizes, at least I don't think they realize, is Apple is a lifestyle company because you got to really dig their lifestyle and their products to buy all of them. Um, I'm an iPhone user just for transparency. And I have some uh, Mac computers. But I don't like the best thing I could describe is there was a a blog post, a news story, whatever it is. I I want to read it verbatim just because they described it perfectly. And you literally can't reinvent the wheel. Uh, on some people's words. Yeah. And it says, for better or worse, that's what Apple's good at, convincing you that you don't miss things. You've lost. Sometimes miss a DVD player, but thanks to the loss of the DVD player and laptops, I haven't looked at optical discs in years. I figured out better solution. Sure, I miss serial ports on PC for plugging in old junk, but at this point, most of the old junk is dead anyways. We're moving into the future here, a future with fewer ports. <laughs> and the reason I read that is it's like, wait a minute. Wait, wait. I still have that old junk that I still use. And fewer ports, that means I'm going to have to buy extra dongles and accoutrements. 
like Shay says, my my MacBook is going to look like a Sega Saturn. It's going to have more stuff piled on it than a junkyard at this point. I mean, what what what's next? You know, I mean, seriously, be like, um, oh, we 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 now want you just to have a touchpad, no more. Uh, no more keyboard. If you want a keyboard, you're going to have to buy this special Mac keyboard for $35 just for QWERTY. I mean, what's next? What are you going to get rid of? I mean, the weirdest part is they're not even touchscreen. I doubt Apple's ever going to be do a touchscreen display. Why get rid of ports when it's the one thing you actually need? I'm just imagining Apple becoming this literally literal floating Apple that like projects a screen and you have to just use it from there. See, because what I'm seeing, I, what I can totally imagine, and maybe this is on a little bit of a ridiculous side, two screens. One a touch screen with a keyboard and one a normal screen. Oh, I'm not even seeing that. I'm just seeing like a screen. <laughs> just one. Oh, oh, kind of like, uh, what, was, uh, what was it? There's a, that Final Fantasy movie or something that came out where all the, everything was like a projection in front of you. Yeah, something like that. I don't know. <sighs> I know Projected I, I, by a floating apple. <laughs> Uh, I like Apple products. I really do. I mean, one thing Apple does do better than every, everybody is they make technology that works work better. I mean, if you take a look at their phones, Apple is, technology-wise, is behind the curve. They don't have, like, multi-use NFC. Um, every phone under the sun that's Android has NFC, which is near-field near communication. Um, they're just not high. They're not, uh, what do you call it? Not bleeding-edge phones. No. But everything just works. So I guess that's the one positive side. But I don't know. I, do we have any other stories? Oh, Let's yes. uh, switch it up a little bit. I don't yeah. want to spend the next 10 minutes bashing Apple. Well, more for uh, from Apple. So apparently um, Apple is going to be getting Twitter and uh, live NFL games. So this is a maybe. It's possibly happening. But yeah, it's looking pretty good. <clears throat> so Twitter reportedly negotiated with Apple to bring the Twitter app to Apple TV, a move that would give streaming platforms millions of users accessing upcoming NFL games. Wait, 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 wait. hold on on that one. Why do you want Twitter on a television? No, I, and this is this is this isn't making a joke. This is serious. I don't see the point of having Twitter on a forty-seven, fifty-seven, uh, like a seventy-eight inch display. What's what's the use case here? So you can see your 140 characters in 47 inch TV. Well, one of the things is is that um, so Twitter has been beating out rivals such as Facebook to secure the rights to stream um, NFL games and uh, MLB games, and NHL games, NBA games. So Twitter's kind of becoming this um, like tyrant as far as being able to show sports stuff. And I'm pretty sure you can do things like stream a game. And probably like have your Twitter feed up at the same time, kind of like a Twitch. You know what Twitch is, right? Yeah, yeah. So, but for our listening audience, what is Twitch? Twitch is basically you can watch. Um, what is it? They they play Bob Ross sometimes. Um, you you basically watch live video streams. So it's interactive television, basically. So you, a lot of times uh, gamers will do it where they'll play like Minecraft or you know one of those Telltale games or whatnot, and you can interact with the uh, player on the side. And uh, you can actually make a bit of money doing that if you have an audience for it. So, okay. So now that you explain it that way, I could see it's not particularly my cup of tea. But so I could see. So what you're saying is you're watching, say, a Niners game and a Raiders game. If you know if they ever play each other again, mm. and then you can have uh, all the comments. You could do like hashtag Raiders Niners and see everything that come up comes up within that conversation. Yeah. And so um, another thing is like you know. With more content, Twitter has the ability to do more video ads and, you know, like, so Twitter's kind of doing a little bit more than just the social media thing as of now. And uh, this might actually make people get Apple TV, like, because I don't know about you, but I know, like, one person with Apple TV. So the funniest thing is Apple TV, there's three out right now. There's the older model, and then there's new one, newer ones, that one that's 32 and one 64 gigs. They, they have built-in hard drives, and I've never used them. Um, but I'm definitely at the use case for them. I've got a home theater PC I have for years. I've got a MacBook right. a Mac Mini hooked up to my TV. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's negatives and drawbacks to that. The best thing about having apps though is everything kind of works, and you don't have to. There's not as many workarounds if you just have apps and you click. I mean, that's one of the reasons I love the Roku. It just works. Right. Well, and and so like 
I don't know too many people that use Apple TV. I know that they have their own content, but it isn't in no way competing with Hulu or Netflix. I don't know if you can get Hulu and Netflix on your Apple TV. Oh, yeah. I bet you okay. have to. I mean, the difference between but Hulu and Netflix is uh, Apple TV is a platform to provide content to. Yes, but they also have their own content. Yeah, I think that would be the one thing. I think, you know, I think that's the only thing they have to separate it is it would be, you know, Apple TV and then, you know, Apple Music, Apple Podcasts. I think that's right. the one thing that they have to separate. And the other question is, has it affected them? I mean, I'm assuming not because if you're an Apple person, you're buying it no matter what anyways. Right. I don't know how much money they're making off of it. Like I said, I've only I've only seen a couple people with it, but maybe bringing NFL games to Apple TV might bring in a whole new audience. I know for cord cutters, it's perfect because that's the one thing a lot of cord cutter cut cord cutters, excuse me, have issues with is watching sports games. That's one of the reasons I know people have stopped being cord cutting because they miss their games. Right. I mean, with the MLB app and, and a few other things, they're starting to get more sports. And we're going to have to save this conversation for another date. Now, we're going to go to a break and we come back from the break. We're going to be talking about an interesting topic involving Nissan. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines, they got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Do you remember um, back in the the 90s, John, when there was a lot of video games um, with cars that had turbo, like Gran Turismo Turbo, Power Rangers Turbo, and turbo was a really big thing? I do. It's just like the word extreme. Right. Turbo was huge. So it's back. Nissan's revolution. Could the new petrol engine make diesel obsolete? The new petrol? Petrol. My bad. Okay, so this is a UK story. (laughs) So, um... Japanese automotive maker, uh, Nissan Motor Company, has come up with a new type of gasoline engine that they say could probably uh, make diesel engines obsolete. I'm curious on that because one of the benefits, at least originally with diesel engines, is they can really run off of everything. I think I've heard stories of peanut oil, perfume. So why do they say it could make diesel engines, you know... Well, I'll tell you. Go the way Let they me drop a few bars for you. The new engine uses variable compression technology, which Nissan engineers say allows it at any given moment to choose an optimal compression ratio for combustion, a key factor in the trade-off between power and efficiency in gasoline fuel engines. So basically what it does is it chooses optimal compression so that way um, gasoline is used more efficiently. So this would depend on the gas. So you no longer have a car that says it requires 87 versus 93 type of thing. Right. And so um, it, it's supposed to, to go on, on like different compression rates. And so um, Nissan says, what is it? Diesel engine is a hot topic globally. We believe that the new engine of ours is an ultimate gasoline engine that could over time replace the advanced diesel engines today. Um, so what the, they think that they're, they're going to replace diesel. Um, so like they've been working on this compression technology, at, at least for like the last 20 years or so, a lot of different, um, car manufacturing company has been kind of looking at this and I guess Nissan's finally done it. Now they've said that the, uh, they're planning on re- releasing this, um, what is it in the Paris motor show, um, this year or next month. Um, and, uh, it's going to showcase the cars. Um, it's, it's going to come out next year. So they're hoping that it'll be a big thing. They're hoping that, you know, people are going to really eat this up. My question is, is that like, how expensive is this going to be? I, I bet right off the bat, it's going to be really expensive. I can, I'm kind of seeing, I could see maybe in their, uh, their SER models, maybe the GTR model, which is mm-hmm. Nissan's higher, their higher cost car. My first thought about this is in theory, this would be amazing. You know, you could drop in 93, you know, 89 or pick, pick your octave. Mm-hmm. 
and it would help you get the best economy you can out of right. anything. Now, the question is, are you going to have economy with speed? Or, are, you know, all of a sudden you're going to be driving like, you know, a 1980s or 1970s Nissan or Toyota. Is it just going to have no power? Um, so according to the article, the what, what exactly is going on here is it's an optimal ratio. So the comparison uh, ratio measures how much the air fuel is mixed into the gasoline and how much it's reduced or compressed. They can kind of control that. And so um, with a higher uh, ratio, it's supposed to be more efficient. And uh, because it's coming with a turbocharger, um, at the end of the day, it's allegedly more powerful. So actually, there's supposed to be a little bit more power and a little bit more torque behind this thing. Okay, see, that that I'm for. I mean, it, I do have a little bit of a lead foot, but I also don't like sacrificing speed for gas mileage. So if, right. if it can tow the line between the two, I'm totally for it. I mean, I don't see it beating out diesel. Now, here's the reason why. Maybe in uh, uh, consumer cars, I can see. But diesel engines still have more power for uh, non-commercial reasons. Whether you're talking about pulling freight, you're never going to see a gasoline engine in, in a 16-wheeler, 18-wheeler. That's just not going to happen. And, and ships and other things. So if they're talking strictly in cars, no, I could see them not having, you know, uh, maybe a, a lot of diesel cars in the future. Right. But so I think of, it's a little bit of a misnomer. I mean, depending on where the article is actually aimed, I guess. They also talk about how, um, you know, not everybody is going to switch over to hybrids and that this might be a good alternative and a good um, – because hybrids are really good about, um, um, like, handling fuel and, and being, you know um, – <clears throat> Well, I know for me, my big problem with hybrids is their strong point, is their batteries. Um, right. For example, I don't buy new I don't buy new cars. For for me, there's just no economic value in it. As soon as you buy it, you drive it off a lot, you automatically lose a good portion of the value. You buy a used car, that loss has already happened. So right. at that that moment the car's bottomed out on the price. So the question is if I buy a 2 or 3 year old hybrid, how long the battery is, how long is the battery going to last? And the problem is those batteries aren't cheap, you know. I've heard anywhere between Three to ten thousand dollars, depending on the car brand and model. Exactly. So I think Nissan's trying to kind of um, engineer this more towards you, to the people who are a little bit more skeptical about hybrids a little bit, and um, they think that this is going to be a really good way to like make sure that there are cars out there besides hybrids that have a great you know fuel um, fuel use. And no. um, another thing that it's considering, they're considering actually turning this into a hybrid system like some versions being hybrid as well so you got this like fuel efficient turbo engine mixed with a battery now here uh, another question for you is how hard is this to work on is this going to be ah. you, you you have to be a certified nissan mechanic because by the sound of it you're definitely not going to be a shade tree mechanic working on a car that has this much uh adjustability into it if that makes sense you know that is a really good point I think the minor stuff you'd probably be able to fix, like radiators and all that kind of good stuff. But, um, yeah, you might need a certified Nissan mechanic. And that's something that I've, I've noticed has been kind of coming up a lot lately with um, electronics and cars. And the, the more we get technologically advanced with cars, the less mechanics are going to be able to um, work on them. I know a good friend of mine, her husband owns a Mercedes garage and is a certified Mercedes mechanic. And I was actually having a similar conversation with him. And his comment was about that is you're no longer going to see a general mechanic. You're never, not going to see a guy who's just a mechanic. You're going to be seeing in the future will be a BMW mechanic, a Mercedes mechanic, a Nissan mechanic, a Toyota mechanic. He said because at this point, all the systems, like you can get the base knowledge, but to get really nitty gritty, you have to focus on one because they're all different and enough that they don't really apply to the other cars. Very interesting. So that's the thing. I, I'm really wondering on cost. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the fact I'm getting best bang for my buck, especially in California when gas is traditionally high, the highest in the nation. And especially depending on if you're in a city or not because there's extra taxes and a bunch of other stuff. So if this can help save me a couple of bucks while giving me more horsepower, I'm totally for it. But I'm skeptical on anything that's, you know, that basic says, we have a solution for your, you know, well, and um, how so, much is this going to cost? Like, are are you are the costs of gas 
going down, going to pay for the car itself. I know that's the big thing with a lot of hybrids is paying for the car itself. My guess, my first guess is this is going to be in their top of the line cars at first. This will be like maybe the, I'm thinking in the Infinity line for sure because Nissan owns Infinity. Maybe in the top of the line Maxima. You know, stuff like that. Ma- right. Anything that has a GTR or a GR uh, logo on, I can see. But I doubt you're going to see this in, you know, like a base model. Not for at least five to, I'd say, 15 years. Well, we have to test it out first. So, I'm, I'm definitely curious to see how well it does. And I know the, the benefit about when they announce it and they get cars out there is people are going to beat the tar out of it. And I can't wait to read Road and Track just to see what their comments are. And it looks like we are coming up on another break. So when we get back, we're going to talk to you guys about cybernetics in the future. Sweet. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back. The next thing we're going to talk about today is something that it will revolutionize lives for everybody who is paralyzed. There's a woman in her 50s who suffered a T6 lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease, I guess is the best way to describe it. Now, she went from apparently life quality from 1980s DOS to, to 2016. Now, basically what this is, is her brain is controlling the tablet. Now, the field of brain machine interface blossomed nearly two decades ago in an effort to develop assistive device to help those locked in people and the result have had fantastic results eye and head tracking devices allowed eye movement to act as output system to control mouse cursors on computer screens like for example think stephen hawking's that's just what he uses to speak with that little computer now see the benefit about this is this helps people who just don't have the ability to communicate in the right way or can't use technology and despite the Deluge of promising devices, eye tracking remains imprecise and terribly tiring to the user's eyes since the system requires custom hardware. Now, two years ago, roughly, a woman with a T6 injury volunteered for the Brain Gate clinical trials, had roughly a 100 channel electrode array planted in the left side of her brain and a region responsible for movement. At this time, the Stanford subdivision was working on a prototype prosthetic device to help paralyzed patients type out words in a custom side keyboard by simply thinking about the word they want to spell. The prototype worked like this. The implanted electrode record, recorded her brain activity as she looked into the target letters in the screen, passed it on to the neuroprosthesis, which then interpreted the signals and translated them into continuous control of the cursor movement and clicks. Now, see, this to me is, is just a totally Star Trek. Yeah, this is pretty cool. I mean... I would love to actually see this in person. I mean, a couple of things I'm curious about is how are they transmitting this? Does she have like uh, like Johnny Mnemonic? Is there a a plug into the back of her neck? Is it using like magnets to connect to her skull? I mean, this is the one thing I'm wondering. Uh, This is awesome for people who just can't move or are, are completely paralyzed. This is the new way for them to communicate with the world. Now, it says here the black and white setup was state-of-the-art in terms of response and accuracy, but the process was painfully slow, and even with extensive training, T6 often had to move her eyes to the delete button to correct her errors. What the field needed was a flexible, customizable, and affordable device that didn't physically connect to a computer via electrode, according to the... I'm sorry, there's no way I'm going to be able to pronounce this guy's name. It's... 
So the, they said their breakthrough movement was when they realized their point-and-click cursor system was similar to tapping a touchscreen. The team took the existing setup and reworked it. T6 brainwaves could control, she, control where she tapped the Nexus touchscreen. So pretty much what it is is they realized instead of a keyboard, a touchscreen. It sped up the mo- it sped everything up. Now the the question for me is what is it going to be like a couple of generations and now on the technology? Is touchscreen the way to go? I mean, the, to me, it seems like it's the perfect way to do it. Why have one mechanical mechanism click on another when a touchscreen serves its purpose perfectly? Now, is it limited to a particular tablet? Because to me, it seems like this is something Android would be perfect for. Right. You know, Android allowing you to basically do whatever you want. Matter of fact, I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere down the few, uh, the future they even forked Android specifically for this reason. So I'm I I know we got more stories uh, regarding these this topic and cybernetics, but I'm really hoping that this just gets cheaper down the road because this is awesome. Yeah, I agree. This is definitely some next level futuristic type stuff, and I would like to see it um, progress in the future. Also for cybernetics. Apparently, our bodies have now become one with the gaming controller. So it's finally happened, guys. So what, what, what they did was they created a stretchy skin-like controller. I believe it just stretches over your arm um, at the so- what is this, SEAL National University. They promised to turn the forearm into a touchpad for gaming, playing music, and scrawling notes that appear on a computer screen. So the team led by researcher Chong Chan Kim... And uh, let's see, Jong Yun Sun, a professor at material science and engineering. They imagine a future where we ditch uh, controllers and brittle electrodes for soft, bio capable technology. So, no more stiff touch panels for humans. We can just use our arms. So, I, I don't know. This kind of seems like 3D TVs to me. This sounds a little bit gimmicky. Cool, but I, I'm not giving up my Xbox controller. Right. No, and it's honestly, I watched the video for it, and um, they have it all hooked up and everything, and it's more of like something you would use for like apps. Um, I feel like it would pair well, pair better with like a phone and not a computer. Like you wouldn't be able to play Skyrim on this thing. <laughs> I. <sighs> I don't know. See, to me, this still seems like a solution in search of a problem. The only thing I think would be cool if, say, if this, the application was, say, I don't know, like a bracelet, something that fits over your wrist, and you work in an environment where having extra accoutrements is dangerous. So, say, I don't know, say if you worked in a factory type of thing, and you walked up, and then some controls popped up, and you had to do certain things. Right. That, to me, seems like it would be useful. I don't really see the use case for this. Um Maybe it's an age thing. <laughs> no, I really don't think it's all that cool. Either. Like, it's cool, but it's, like, not necessary. I think the only thing I would ever even use this for is, like, having my phone in my back pocket and I want to switch the song. Just click. But, but by the way, this is why I have a, an Apple Watch. I think the smart watch <laughs> right, does the same that. thing. Yeah, no, no, no doubt. So the developed Panimal uses hydrogel made from, um, like, water-soluble... Sol- um, material, so it's it acts like an electric conductor. And um, now, does it need your 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 skin? Because here's my thought. I think it does. Because my thought is, if they could somehow work this into, say, a kid's toy, I think this would be revolutionary. Sure. You know, if you figured out how to have touch pan uh, screens, you know, and flexible this and fla- I think that'd be cool in a kid's toy. But for me controlling the TV, I'm not strapping something to my wrist. <laughs> So one of the things that uh, it's not super precise, they tried to write out a word like hello, and it didn't really work so well. Um, It's not as precise to say like a normal touchpad, but it is kind of cool that, you know, they've got this new stretchy arm controller. I guess it's cool that it exists. I just don't understand like the practical use for it. I guess they said that after, you know, repeated use, the material doesn't like stay as flexible, like it's pretty flexible. It can uh, what like stretch over more than one thousand percent of its normal size, according to the article. And um, but yeah, it says that over time it loses its flexibility. And so they're saying they might need to make a special moisturizer just to make it kind of like not get brittle. I, I'm thinking this is. Uh, I've always jokingly said because was the greatest justification for anything, and I think that's what this is. This was well. Let's see if we can do this. I. Th- I 
Right. I have no doubt it'll be like Corning, who made Gorilla Glass like 40 years ago, finally finding a reason for it to exist. I bet at some point in history they're going to find a use case for this. I just don't think it's going to be today. Right. Maybe when they come out with a flexible material, like maybe they'll make a watch out of it someday when they can also project the watch in it and they figure out the problem of it becoming brittle. You know, when they, when they figure all these, these, these issues out. Now, we're coming close to the end of the show, but I, I did want to talk about something that I think is awesome. One of the benefits of having like the, an Apple Watch, for example, and all the, like out in the phones is you get, to, uh, you get to quantify yourself. You get to keep a little bit better measure of your health. Now, this gentleman had a death in the family, and it inspired him to create an iPhone case that measures your blood pressure. Now, the guy said he wanted to give people the, the power to measure and track blood pressure everywhere. So why not embed the sensor in an ultra slim phone case so it can be with you every day? Benefit about that is you can track, you know, what really sets you off. You know, say if you're a person who has to keep even temper and going to the store makes you mad, you know, or talking to a lawyer makes you mad. Now, the phone case itself doesn't look remarkable, but with the clear... The team clearly going for functionality over the aesthetics. So it's a little bit bunky, uh, bunky, excuse me, bulky and lightweight, so it shouldn't get in your way too much. Now, the phone case sports two radar sensors that detect tissue movement and blood flow. The data captures is presented by Lumio's Labs algorithm. Their company app records information, provides history of your pressure and heart rate readings down to the day. Now, this is something that I think unlike the last story will revolutionize people's lives. I especially right. think, and today when, you know, people don't exercise enough, I think this, this gives real world results to modern lifestyles. I, I think this is going to change the world. This is really interesting too, because I think this is the first step in um, incorporating one of the first steps in incorporating health into um, your uh, everyday tools. Like it would be really cool if we could take similar technology and turn maybe, a phone into a um, like like a pancreas pump yeah you know? like being able to help people with diabetes and uh, you know being able to pump insulin like if we could make an app for that and maybe like an attachment to the phone like you know we could really have some cool see I useful think, technology and then a phone won't I just be... I think in that case and unfortunately we're running a little late but I think what's gonna happen is there'll be like a headless smaller device a pancreas pump and the control is via an app. Yeah, no, and, exactly. And then I think the coolest thing about that is it could give you real world display on your blood sugar. It could give you like it could give you the exact amount it's pumping. I literally think, like I said before, and and Shay's alluding to, is this could change the world for the better when we are able to just understand how our bodies work because everybody works a little bit different. Right, and um, it'd be great for it would be great to have um, cell phones be used for medical uses. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to go to Facebook dot com. Go to the bar at the bottom, uh, the the top. Type in GSMC Technology Facebook page. This is episode. I think this is 23. 23. And I, I want you to find this episode, comment on it, and I want you to say, did you like this episode? Do you hate this episode? Or is there a story that you're just dying for us to read or get our spin on? The other thing is I want you to go to gsmcpodcast.com, click on Technology Podcast and subscribe. You can find us anywhere on the interwebs. And I'm Jonathan Charney. And I'm Shane Northrup. And as always, thank you for listening. <laughs>